Uh, so I'll be talking about stem cell therapy to treat perianal Crohn's disease. So we all know in this room, perianal Crohn's disease is a terrible disease. About a third of patients will have this who have Crohn's. It's aggressive, it's disabling, it causes pain and discharge, fecal incontinence, uh, social and sexual dysfunction, narcotic addiction, hospitalizations, huge medical bills, a number of interventions with both medical therapy and surgical therapy, as we heard this morning. Uh, difficulty maintaining jobs, and again, it's just notoriously difficult for all of us to treat, both on the gastroenterology side and the surgical side. So when we think about the goals of fistula treatment, it's really to successfully eliminate all current and recurrent disease while preserving sphincter function. So it's really important that we think about all these patients that come to us, they might have had multiple interventions done already, or they have distal proctitis, or some of the operations that we may do for a non-Crohn's patient um, that we apply to the Crohn's patient who might have a baseline of incontinence, we need to be aware that any intervention we're doing to preserve sphincter function. And we kind of already touched on this this morning, so I'll briefly go through this. But there's a number of ways we can medically manage perianal Crohn's disease with antibiotics, thiopurines, and anti-TNF therapy. And we heard a really nice presentation by Paulo about how anti-TNF therapy can successfully at least help with healing. But it certainly doesn't achieve 100% healing rates. So many patients, two-thirds of patients, will recur after stopping therapy. Very few achieve long-term durable remission with medical management. And most ultimately require some sort of surgical intervention. And as we heard again by Dr. Bemelman about the importance of really closing the internal opening. So these patients do require surgery. And there's many surgery options available. And this really highlights the point that no particular intervention that we have achieves 100% healing, which is why we have so many options. And so all these have their limitations. So aceton, already discussed again, but it's really useful to uh, drain perianal sepsis and can be used in combination with biologic therapy to occasionally achieve healing. Uh, fistulotomy has limited utility, I think, in Crohn's disease patients, but if there's a patient without any proctitis and has very distal disease and very limited involvement in the sphincter complex, fistulotomy can achieve good healing rates. But again, this is very a very limited population, I think, that we see with perianal disease. Fibrin glue and plugs are quite limited with uh, poor healing rates, maybe up to one-third, some trials would suggest. An endorectal advancement flap. Uh, is useful if the patient doesn't have proctitis or lift or diversion. Uh, and then unfortunately, about 20 to 30 percent of patients will end up requiring proctectomy simply because we don't have very effective ways to achieve healing. So kind of in summary of what we have to date with medical therapy in our current surgical interventions, basically the most advanced therapy we have really leads to a one-year remission rate of 40 to 50 percent. So we have a lot of room to work, and there's a significant need for improved treatment options. So where do stem cells fit in in this? So the first study came from the Garcia Olmo group in Spain. This was in 2003, and this was using autologous mesenchymal stem cells, and it was a patient that was a 33-year-old female. She had a complex rectovaginal fistula. Uh, she had tried infliximab with no healing. They tried a vaginal fat flap plasty, and she actually had sepsis following this. Again, no healing. So the group did a lipoaspirate of autologous cells and injected uh, 9 million cells. And within a week, the fistula was actually healed, and at three months, it had sustained healing. So they were pretty excited. They thought this was a great treatment option, a uh, very good alternative. So they then did a phase one study. And there's only four patients in this study, but if you can see here, there's a very diverse in terms of the locations, so rectovaginal, enterocutaneous, uh, perineal, so many different fistula sites. And they achieved 75% healing at eight weeks with injection of cells. And one of the other important things with the phase one, because phase one is te testing safety, not efficacy, there were no significant adverse events. So three quarters of patients healed without any adverse events. So again, particularly exciting results. So then they did a phase two trial <clears throat> where they randomized patients to receive fibrin glue alone or autologous cells. There were 35 patients, and this included both cryptoglandular and Crohn's, so only 14 patients were Crohn's. They injected 20 million cells, assessed healing at eight weeks, and then came back and injected 40 million more if they did not achieve healing at eight weeks. 
71% healed with injection alone, and at one year, quality of life was improved, and they only had 17% recurrence. So significantly improved healing rates from conventional therapy. There was another phase two trial done out of Korea, 33 patients injecting cells of different dosages, uh, second injection if they didn't achieve healing, 82% healing at eight weeks, 88% sustained at one year. So again, really improved with what we had to have to currently offer. And again, importantly, no adverse events, uh, no risk to the sphincter, and so it's very safe. Well, what about bone marrow? So those studies used lipoaspirate, where they took some abdominal wall fat, autologous cells. And then we've also looked at bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells. So this is only 10 patients that did a direct injection, and the primary endpoint was complete epithelialization of the external opening. Two-thirds had complete healing at eight weeks, and this was maintained at one year. So very good healing compared to what we currently have. <clears throat> so what about allogeneic cells? So the issue with autologous cells is that there may be an advantage in that we don't generate antibodies when we deliver them, but it requires an additional procedure to harvest them, either with lipoaspirate or an incision and obtaining abdominal wall fat or a bone marrow harvest. And allogeneic is nice because it offers an off-the-shelf product that you can simply deliver to the patient when they first come in. So we've started looking at allogeneic, and I'll go through a few of the trials here. So there is a phase one, two, again, out of the garcia Olmo group from Spain. 24 patients, injection of 20 million cells. And this time they start using clinical and MRI healing. And I'll talk a little bit about this. Those initial studies with the percent healing and the 80%, we're looking at clinical healing. And the clinical healing was defined as closure of the external tract or no drainage to palpation, but they did not get MRI to assess healing. So I think it's an important distinction because you'll see the rates drop a little bit here. So this was looking at both clinical healing, meaning cessation of drainage on pal palpation, as well as MRI healing. So 56% with complete healing of treated tracts. And then 30% healing, this is if they had a complex branching tract and that didn't have direct injection, those nearby tracts, a third of those also healed. And then there was the recent phase three trial that came out and uh, recently published, and this was European centers as well as Israeli center. And 49 hospitals, 212 patients, it's a randomized trial. They did a single injection of 120 million allogeneic mesenchymal stem cells versus control. And the primary endpoint was, again, clinical and radiographic healing. So MR, they could not have an abscess larger than two centimeters. 50% healing as compared to 34% in the control. So the, you can see the placebo rate is actually quite high here. They curetted the tract, did a ligation of the internal opening, going back to that importance of closing the internal opening, and 34% achieved healing. So the delta is only 16%, so a little bit lower than what we saw with those initial studies from the garcia Olmo group of in the 80 percentile. Uh, and also, again, I think it also is a reflection of how the healing was defined, not only clinically, but also radiographically. But importantly, adverse events are very low. So there were some patients, a little small font, but 5% who withdrew from the trial, but that was the same in the placebo group as well as the treatment group. And when you looked at adverse events, most commonly this was pain at the injection site or an occasional abscess at the injection site, but the same, so equivalent in both the placebo and the treatment groups. So we talked a little bit about adipose-derived versus bone marrow-derived. Uh, we don't have any studies directly comparing the two, so it's hard to say if one is more has better efficacy than the other. Autologous versus allogeneic, again, there is no direct comparison between the two cell types. I think the arguments for autologous are that they do not generate antibodies to them, so there's a little bit of a, I think, preference that they may be more efficacious in the long run if people need repeat treatment or repeat injection. However, allogeneic are nice that they offer an off-the-shelf product that we can deliver to patients when they come to see us in clinic. So we did some thinking at Mayo Clinic about, well, is there a way that we could deliver the cells so that they stayed in the local mi microenvironment for a longer duration than simply injecting them and having some of them wash out of the tract? So we were trying to think of a scaffolding option to deliver cells rather than simple direct injection. 
So what we did is the Gore plug uh, that came out in 2006 really was designed for long tracks and single tracks, not branching tracks. And the success was pretty low with the plug alone. But what we thought is, well, what if we were able to combine the therapy of using the plug and the cells on top of the plug? So we developed a protocol to harvest abdominal wall fat and then expand the cell number and then it basically was soaked in the plug. So the plug itself had about 20 million cells on electron microscopy prior to delivery. And what we found is we had 12 patients that were enrolled, uh, about half were female, young, young age. All of them had been on biologic therapy and all of them had, had a number of surgical interventions prior to this. And we had no serious event, uh, perioperative adverse events, no reported incontinence, and we actually had 83% healing at six months. And now our one-year data that we have that should be coming out uh, relatively soon, but all patients are now at one year, and it's 80, the same rate, 83% healing. So it's a, I think the percentage is higher than maybe some of the other trials that are reported, but I think it's important to note that this trial included only patients with a single tract, so multi-tracks or branching complex fistulas that we often see in Crohn's were not included. And the Lancet phase three included up to three tracks. So it's a little bit, I think, important to consider that. So this is what we saw. This is after the gore plug is placed on the inside. There's a disc that closes the internal opening that's sutured into place. So these are the, the tails that are coming out here. And at four weeks, you can see that that opening is basically shut, and at 24 weeks, completely sealed. And this is another patient, same thing. So our healing rates, we defined healing as both cessation of drainage to palpation and then also MRI healing, of complete healing of the tract. So a number of trials have now been completed. I think that the success that we saw with the initial trials coming out of that Garcia Omo group really kind of spurred a wave of enthusiasm for this as being an up and coming therapy that might offer a better treatment for patients. And so now there's been a number of studies that have been done. Uh, this top group of them are those using autologous cells, again, both from adipose and bone marrow. There's only one that's been from bone marrow. And then this was an autologous bone marrow, that one study, and then allogeneic. <clears throat> And then there's now a number of ongoing trials as well. So these are trials that are currently enrolling and have yet to be completed. So there's just, there's a, I think a lot of interest around this therapy and a lot of questions though still remaining. So one future clinical trial that's coming to the US shortly is this Tygenix trial. So the same, same trial that was published in the Lancet, that phase three trial, we're repeating now in US centers and European centers. So you may be hearing about that soon. So why mesenchymal stem cells? We're still really unsure as to why they might promote healing, but we do know they have immunomodulatory action. Uh, and they promote Treg cells, I think, which is important for Crohn's disease patients. They do have regenerative capability, and importantly, they migrate to site of injury. So when we inject them, the idea is that they're gonna migrate to the local environment of where we need them to heal. Optimal dosing, this remains a question. We really don't know. The studies that have been done now have used a number of different dosages. And what's interesting is when studies have compared different doses, lower doses have actually been found to be more efficacious than the higher doses. So it's a little bit uncertain as to how many cells we should be injecting. Some have had dosages based on length of fistula tract. Some have been arbitrary based on previous clinical trials and some inject the dose into two or three tracks versus one. So we're really unsure still on the dosing. And what about repeat injection? So again, clinical trials have been variable. Some have included only a single injection. Some assessed healing at eight weeks and then repeated the injection. So there's great variability. And both have had success, both repeat injections and single injection. So I think this is another outstanding question, and we have not yet compared this across trials. And then how do we assess healing? So again, those initial trials that showed healing rates up to 88% really defined healing clinically. So looking at the external opening and seeing that that was closed and that was defined as clinical healing. But I think it's important that we also bring in uh, radiographic healing, ideally with MRI. And these are the recent ECHO guidelines which state that in the setting of clinical trials, MRI in combination with clinical assessment is really now considered mandatory. And I think that that's important um, because I think that just assessing the external opening 
I think that the healing rates that we achieve uh, in clinical trials may be a little bit artificially elevated, but if we can show and demonstrate both radiographic healing as well as clinical healing, I think that's much more convincing. In adverse events, I think uh, another thing to note is this has really been safe. So there, really, there have been no systemic complications or systemic inf infections that have been reported. The most frequent adverse events have been pain at the site of injection and perianal abscess, which has been equivalent, again, in both the treatment groups and the placebo groups. And then a quick couple slides on rectovaginal fistula. So <clears throat> rectovaginal fistula are also very difficult to treat. And Crohn's disease is the second most common cause behind obstetrical trauma. It affects up to 10% of our female patients, so a significant number. It's very distressing. Quality of life is greatly diminished with a rectovaginal fistula, and there's very poor outcomes with available treatments. So the available treatments now, you can give biologic therapy and place aceton. Glue and plugs are very limited in terms of the treatment efficacy. Uh, advancement flaps on the rectal and the vaginal side. <coughs> A gracilis flap does achieve healing in about a third of patients, and Mardius the same thing. But you can see this is pretty morbid, so the healing rates may be good, but it's a pretty morbid operation. <coughs> Sorry. So if we could deliver stem cells with a simple direct injection that provided efficacy that was similar to doing a flap, that would be a great advantage. So this is one study looking at that 10 patients injected with 20 million cells, 60% healing. So much better than doing that complex flap and leaving a patient with open incision and significant morbidity. And then at Mayo Clinic, we're now enrolling rectovaginal patients into that plug trial. So same idea, using the plug, 20 million cells on the plug, and placing that. And we have one patient I actually just did before I came to the meeting this week. So in summary, perianal Crohn's disease is notoriously difficult to treat, and we're very limited, I think, with current medical and surgical options. So stem cell-based therapy may prove to be superior, but I think we still have a lot of outstanding questions regarding uh, dosing, how we define healing, reinjection. So I think future research will really help us determine optimal treatment protocols. So can stem cell therapy treat Crohn's fistula? I think there's certainly a role, and I think uh, we just need a little bit more data to come out as in comparison to conventional therapy, and I think when we better answer some of these outstanding questions, we may be able to really optimize the way that we use uh, stem cell therapy and the way it's implemented into clinical practice. Thank you.